Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pixelist, the nerdy podcast about all the things we enjoy. I'm Will, that's Blake, and today we're back to our bread and butter, baby. We are talking some Critical Role. <laughs> the OG. Three. That's right. Bringing it back. Are you, you you tweaked our little our little intro a little bit, saying Did I? It's, our, it's our nerdy podcast, which I was like, yeah, our nerdy <laughs> pod. That's right. Which what is, we always... I've been struggling on the intro. I don't know why, but like for the last like... I think the intro is awesome. Okay, yeah. Did I, but I didn't even realize I said something different. I've been like, yeah, like, this I was like, definitely not like we didn't plan this. This isn't like baiting people to be like, hey, good job, man. <laughs> but <laughs> just genuinely, I think I think your intro's great. So, well, thanks. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, uh, nerd stuff. Yeah, We're talking about some uh, some critical role. Right. Dude, I feel like whenever I'm not thinking about D and D, I just want to be in the world of D and D. Like, am I the only one who feels that way? Like. Like when I'm not playing it, when I'm not watching it, like I just, I don't know. I just keep thinking about it. Yeah. I'm jealous even because I'm the same way, but I haven't, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of the last time I even played D and D. I guess That'd it was for birthday, my birthday right? last year. Yeah, yeah. A year ago. Yeah. Big Will has a birthday coming up next month. So I don't know why like, <laughs> we're expecting anybody to do anything. <laughs> you guys better throw me a party. Yeah. So. Anyway, yeah, so we're talking some Campaign 3 today. Um, other announcements, we've kind of, I'll speak for myself, kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit in terms of, like, posting and editing, like, process, just because it's, I guess, after, like, three or four weeks of it, it's been tough to fit everything in. But So we have our reaction for episodes um, 10, 11, 12 for Vox Machina to get out, our discussion for it last of us episode five discussion and then this critical role episode and then are they on there's an episode tonight but the next thursday they're off is that right you're muted i forgot today was thursday i've i've been lost yeah. man. for the past <laughs> month i've just been lost uh all I right think... so that's that's our <laughs> that's the summary of like how kind of how we're treating things i guess <laughs> um yeah i don't know i guess so because I would assume they're off, but I haven't heard anything about it. I I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment because now that we're wrapping up Vox Machina, um, and then also which was freaking amazing, by the way, and then also since think about The Last of Us only has four episodes left, I I, I all of a sudden I'm like, well, what do we? What else can we like do now? Yeah. And I'm like, no, maybe we should just pump the brakes and go back to some <laughs> you know <laughs> regularity with like Critical Role, so. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it's been, I, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying right now, but I too had <laughs> that good? same, I had that same thought. You of, had like uh, this like moment of just like pause. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on over there? I was like, where am I? Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, during the breakdowns, which I still have one more breakdown to do. Anybody that, you know, is keeping up with the channel and wondering where that is, that's still coming. Um, but I've been asking people, I was like, I kind of enjoy doing this. So like, let me know other type of like breakdown content or not even, you know, whatever. I was like, let me know. So I might make some like generalized critical role lore video breakdowns or something too. At, yeah, at I some think, point. I, I think that would be good. And, you know, you're so knowledgeable about it. Um, quick shout out about the breakdowns, just as someone super biased and naturally I would want as many people to see it as possible. But um, <laughs> if you enjoy Critical Role and you enjoy Legend of Vox Machina, definitely check out those breakdowns. Um, for me, like they have like a deep coffee vibe to them of just like mm. cozying up. And I'm just like, ooh, yeah, tell me tell me what's going on in this in this episode. Um, and it's always, just, so, just in general, by the way, again, this is like total shameless bias, but... Um, they're all like really legitimate Easter eggs in like data points that Will talks about as opposed to you, you know, when you like, sometimes you watch those breakdowns where it's like, like someone like, it's not just like a reach, but it's like, just kind of like pandering, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like your, your breakdowns are so authentic, which, you know, anyway. Well, thanks man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, that. I guess today we're talking episode 48, I think. That's right. That is indeed correct. And I think it was called like something escape, yeah, um, uh, an exit most fraught. Yes, an exit most fraught. Um, so, are we ready to? Are we ready to jump in? By the way, yeah, I think so. Um, so, 
Uh, if you're new to us, we dive into a recap of each episode of Critical Role to get everybody on the same page before we go into our actual discussion. And we cut that recap out of our podcast and host it separately on YouTube for your convenience. So if you happen to find yourself on that recap video and you're interested to hear Blake and I's full thoughts on the episodes, uh, we will link that down below. But without further ado, let the recap begin. Once again, this is episode 48, An Exit Most Fraught. So we pick up basically with um, immediately Fern making her first death saving throw. Because if you'll recall, she got knocked unconscious at the end of last episode and she fails uh, this death saving throw. So the party has basically rushed into this nearby like forest thicket um, and they are just hiding under their hero, car, hero call veils, which are the things that make them invisible, but they cannot move. Uh, and they're basically like, okay, what do we do? Because they have like the entire unseelie army after them, basically. And they're in like a really precarious position. Um, FCG does flip their change finger coin, which has become like pretty standard for them. It's kind of memeish. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. Trying to decide if um, they should heal Fern or not. Uh, like risk, like moving and taking an action. Um, it lands up on yes. So FCG heals Fern. She comes back to consciousness and then they're like, okay, like what do we do? Um, they discuss, you know, you know how critical role is they plan. Um, but Imogen ultimately ends up using her catapult spell to launch something basically like in the far opposite direction to try to cause a noise over there to distract them. Um, she does that. It works. And so they basically, you know, start trudging along um, during this opening. Um, and as they're trudging along, the uh, Gloam Gut, which I'm just going to call GG probably from here on out for simplicity's <laughs> sake, uh, lets out another breath attack. And the way this is working is like they're all looking for Bell's Hells this whole time. And the GG is like going to still be attacking. And Matt is basically basing it on the group's stealth checks. Like if right. – uh, for example, like if somebody rolled beneath a 10, Matt's going to consider that that big arcing breath like happens to find them as they're hiding type of thing. <clears throat> so um, one of these breaths that gets let let out uh, ends up hitting Laudna and FCG and this lo knocks uh, Laudna unconscious. FCG is able to bring her back up and um, the GG didn't like actually find them in that moment. So it's still circling around. And at this point, Chetney pulls out the horn that he bought from the Trove of Marwa back at the yeah, start of the campaign. I yeah. love the callbacks, man. Yeah, me too. And he blows a sound into it, which basically it like throws the noise somewhere right. else, kind of like a ventriloquist. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that again works just like the catapult and attention shifts over to there. So the party is kind of continuing this like. Move a little bit, hide under the veil. Move a little bit, hide under the veil. Um, and they eventually get to these watchtowers that they saw last episode that has like the the light radius that is like a sentry tower, essentially. So now they're having to navigate these as well. There is a little bit where the iron tithe comes back into play. The ground right. kind of like starts to suck up Imogen, but they are able to get past that. Um and the party's like in rough shape right now. Like Imogen doesn't have any spell slots. So she uses some of her sorcery points to get back uh, third level so she can cast message to Nana Mori. And she just says like, hey, we're in trouble. We really need your help. We need to find the exit. Like, where is it from where we are? And she kind of explains where they are. Uh, but there's no response. So Orem kind of hikes up a tree and trying to look for this fey gate that Morgan had told them about. And he thinks he knows the direction they need to go. So they start, you know... More trekking, more stealth checks, um, while the GG is circling and getting closer and closer. Um, when it's getting real close, all of a sudden, this massive hawk-like creature slams into the side of it. And yeah, the two, dude. Like, crash. Um, and they can see that it is Mori kind of like riding this hawk. And she's just, you know, arrived to help them. And at one point, like, they crash over the side of a mountain. And they're like, this is our chance. Like, we got to go. And Fern's like, Morgan will be okay. She's killed you know, far bigger things than that. So they make their way to this bramble where they think the fey gate is. And um, there's this monstrous like cyclop creature that comes out with like these four huge arms and no feet. Uh, but it has this like air of regality about it and introduces, <laughs> introduces himself as Tarosh, the lidless slumber. And he speaks entirely in rhymes and basically asks the party, like, why have you come? What favor do you ask? 
Um, and this whole section is great. And I would highly recommend like if you're, just, if you're watching this recap and you didn't watch the episode, at least yeah. go back and watch this section. That's so good. Um, yeah, because my recap's not going to do it justice. But essentially what happens is um, since he speaks in rhymes, the party must also speak in rhymes back to him. And every time they don't, he grows like larger and more menacing. And like he starts salivating, Matt describes. And so they have to take in rhymes and they also have to offer something like a little trinket or a little item. And once they do both of those things, he allows them to pass through the Fey gate. Uh, and everyone, you know, doesn't really have an issue with this, except for Imogen, who is like really <laughs> struggling with rhyming <laughs> and also deciding what to give him. And they're like, we found Laura's weakness. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was great. Uh, Fern is the last one through. And like just as she's going through the the GG is like swooping down, like having found them. But she makes it out um, on the oh, other side of the gate. It was amazing. Uh on the other side, they regroup and they quickly realize they're in the Talent Highlands close to Galvan, which is Imogen's hometown. And they basically debate, um, should they go there or not? Right. Imogen is really hesitant. Everyone else is like, we should go there. But she she thinks there's nothing there for her. Uh, but the rest of the party thinks it'd be good to just at least go to a nearby city. So that way they could get the airship or potentially plane rider Rin, like a distinct location to come retrieve them from. Um. They take a short rest, and during this time, Matt has uh, Liam and Marisha make a bunch of D20 rolls with no explanation. Um, we, we might talk yeah. about this in the episode, so I'll save it for then. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> they then decide to take a long rest, and during that time, um, Imogen messages Rin, catches her up to speed. Uh, she is currently spying on the Exandrian Malleus key and tells her that there's another group um checking out the shadow fell one as well. And Imogen's like, okay, Hey, here's where we are. We might need you to come get us. And basically like, as Rin is responding, she's like, Oh crap. And like the message goes dead. Uh, and they're like, Oh, hopefully that's okay. So she then messages captain Zandis and tells them, Hey, you know, we're going to be going toward Gelvon. If you can come there to pick us up, kind of as like a, a backup since they didn't really hear from Rin. Everyone is going to sleep for that long rest now. There's one last conversation, though, between Orem and FCG, where Orem basically is just checking in on FCG and making sure that, you know, even the helpers need help, just kind of making sure his friend is okay. And yeah. they have a little bit of a heart to heart. And uh, that's where we go to break. It's 12 days from the Apogee Solstice. Rin is not responding. They do send a second message to her, uh, and Rin does not respond. And uh, uh, Orem kind of makes a joke about, like, she might be dead because every time we message someone and they don't respond, they have been dead. Um, but Rin's like a massively powerful character, so they're like, she's probably going to be okay. Well, since they can't get Rin to come help them, they do decide, okay, let's go to Galvan. And like Will mentioned, there's a lot of, uh, tension's not the right word, but there's a lot of like just debate around is this the right move because they're they're adding up like the days to make it to that Exandrian Malleus Key. And they think it's going to be about seven days to make it there, maybe less. Um, but in general, they just know that this is all going to be very close over the next several days. All that to say, um, before they head to, to Galvan, they do decide to do a uh, shared dream experience because they have found out that they can, through Imogen's dream, they can essentially scry um, on another location. So they do shared dream. It's Imogen, FCG, um, I think Ladna and Chetney. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember who else was present. I think it was just them. Okay. So they do this shared dream and they basically go, you know, as they're floating orbs uh, to the Exandrian build site of the Malleus Key. And some things that happen there, first of all, they notice these large, powerful golems that Matt describes as being unlike what they've seen before. Uh, FCG is going to look a bit closer at one, and though he hasn't seen it before, or it's not necessarily like, oh, this is a blank, there's something incredibly familiar related to those technology, the technology of those golems, and he himself. Uh, so possibly both pre-calamity. They also do see the Malleus Key that is sort of entrenched up against this large spire. And it looks like the excavation crew is digging these large control 
um, arcane rods like deep into the earth, uh, which Travis picks up as being possibly like a fail safe, um, just more energy conduits to uh, keep the key from being destroyed, like what's happened in the Fey Wild. Uh, as they're looking and kind of seeing all of this, they also see a certain person uh, petrified as a statue at the center of it, and it is Plains Rider Wren, who, like I mentioned, um, has been petrified. Um, so they're like, that's not good. Okay, let's get out of here. But before they can leave, they draw the attention of a certain Adahan Thule, who somehow seemingly is able to see them. And Adahan is going to do um, a psychic attack on both FCG and I think Imogen. Uh, it does 36 points of psychic damage, and everyone wakes up. And not only do they wake up, Matt just explains that those two characters have, um, it almost feels like a hangover, like a headache, like they're sore in their mind. And either both of them or just FCG uh, starts the day with a point of exhaustion. Um, yeah. I think it was Chetney and FCG, and they both oh, okay. got the Great. exhaustion. Yeah. So both have are exhausted, have a point of exhaustion. Um, the party continues to go to, to Galvan. Um, immediately, this small farm town is put off by this group that's walking through. Um, and basically, um, their plan is to find Imogen's dad, and then hopefully, if they need, they can connect to Master Faramore, who is this merchant who's sort of well known in, Mar in, in the area of Marquette. All that to say, um, uh, Xandis is actually arriving around this time with the massive skyship. They realize, you know what, let's just talk with her dad, kind of have a heart to heart, and then we can move on. Um, they do go to her dad's like sort of stable or like farm area. And we have a really tough conversation where Imogen is like, Hey dad. And he's like, Oh, Hey, why are you here? Um, just not the warm, cozy father we would probably hope to have. Yeah. And um, she basically says, like, hey, why, did you, why didn't you tell me my mom was alive? Like, what happened with you guys? And um, her dad is basically like, um, um, his name's Relvin, by the way, um, is basically like, you know, uh, I, she may have always had her powers, but I think she left because she was more interested. I think he says, like, she cared more about curiosity than what we had or something like that like this itching need to know more about herself than sort of stay with the family um and uh from that it's just a really it's just a really tough conversation um i will say relvin does give her a um kind of like a little locket with seemingly her fingerprint pushed into it's like a metal um locket thing with like a fingerprint in it and there's an inscription in it that reads um, I think it was uh, two halves make a better whole, um, implying like now we're like fuller, more whole now that we've had Imogen. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really sad. Um, she does see her horse, Flora. Um, I can't remember if I'm missing anything else from this conversation other than just sad. <laughs> yeah, not really. Just they, they wanted something that like was Liliana's to like help them connect to her. So I think that's why he got right. the locket. That's right. That's right. And he also, it's funny, they had also asked him, like, before he got that, gave that to them, they asked, like, is there a favorite song that she loved? And I was kind of envisioning, like, in the epic battle, they, would they have sung it to her? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, right, so they get they get the locket, and then they um, they head to Xandis' ship. And um, there's no skyport here, so there's just this small farmland with this massive skyship setting in. And um, the party makes their way. But Making the way. that's yeah, <laughs> that is what happened in episode 48 of campaign three of critical role. So boom, boom. Yeah. Um, and again, if you're on this recap video, check down the description box for the link to our full discussion. Uh, but with that being said, let's jump right into it, I suppose. Um, All right, let's get the let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Get the obvious stuff out of the way. Um, Loved it. Yep. Loved it. <laughs> I uh, already talked about it a bit, but that. uh that whole encounter at the Fey Gate was so much fun. Um, How does Matt come up with these things? Like, because what I was thinking was like they when they got to the Fey Gate, I was like, oh my gosh, how are they going to fight this thing and fight uh, Gloom Glut? Mm. But Matt gave a nice little 
hint, I guess, because you said the uh, Terosh like gave kind of like a regal pose, and it pulled me back to Morgan's advice on like just know when to give, yeah, like a a softer whatever versus like fight. Um, but That's I thought, a what a point. what an amazing encounter, I guess. Yeah, that was so fun. That was so fun. Um, which I guess we could just go ahead and talk about it now. But yeah, I just I, I liked the episode as well. I thought there were a lot of you know, it kind of started out with this high stakes. Like we we talked about it last episode. I was like, are they, what are they going to do? Um, yeah. I guess it. I don't. I guess I should go back and watch the end of of two episodes ago because I don't remember. I thought they were still like in danger, but this one kind of started with them like already being hidden. You know what I'm saying? I well, Matt sort of brushed over it at the start in the sense of like they were rushing out of the gate, and I, I think I think we kind of like for the sake of the game, kind of D and D esque deified it a little bit in the sense of like conveniently there weren't like the war band that was right there or whatever. Mm. But um, the previous episode they were rushing out of the gate. Gloam Glut was like chasing and like got caught like in the gate, right? Like trying to like snap after like um, whoever. And then Matt in the start of this episode said that Gloamglut had gone over top to like I guess because it was too thick in right. the uh, in the woods. But um, and then also I think I think the eagle was I don't think Morgan was riding it. I think it was Morgan. Oh, it was her. Yeah, I think she. I think is how I took it was that here that she was as a massive eagle, just like you know, which was still super epic. Yeah. Um, but you could just see, I think it was Ashley who was like, yes, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Which that was one of the things we talked about last episode of like, how are they going to get out of this? The more right. than Trump card, which I'm glad that they uh, thought of that. Um, yeah. What would they have done? Pretty if, dire. Yeah. I if don't Imogen know. didn't have a spell slot to contact Morgan, That's you know, didn't have the sorcery question. points to get it back. Yeah. <laughs> um, good question. Once again, though, I the fact that let's see, Gloomglut's breath attack was like thirty or forty points of damage. I mean, Sorrow Lord Zethuda, obviously like a massive opponent. We talked about like could they maybe fight just him? And after seeing this episode, I would think maybe not. Uh, maybe full power, maybe they could have. But um, I, I, I hate to be like a broken record, but like I keep having these moments where I'm like. Bro, this party is like swinging way above their pay grade. <laughs> like, think about also the um, Exandrian excavation site. How Plains Rider Wren is petrified. Mm -hmm. Like, if she's gotten bested, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, um, which not to get too far into that, but I'm just thinking out loud how parties just they're just squeezing by by the skin of their teeth. Right, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk more about the Rin stuff a little bit later, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is something we've talked about a few times of like the, this solstice and what's happening here feels very like feels very end game, but clearly it's, it's not unless this campaign is just going to be 50 episodes long. Um, uh, like but, we're dead. We're done. Yeah, we're good. So it, that's like, you know, and again, I don't, I don't want to just retread the same conversations you and I have had, but like, how is Matt going to play this? Like what is there just going to be some sort of not, not diminished stakes, but just like some level appropriate mission they go on in regards to this greater whole. Like surely they don't just march down to lewdness to and Odahan and are like, we're stopping you. Like, cause they're not strong. Like they would die. I think if they tried to do that. So like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm interested to see kind of what they was, can take out of this pie. Or... Yeah, I was wondering if like, like in the last like several episodes since like episode 33, I think it was that they fought, um, Adahan. You know, it's been 15. It will be have been 16 episodes. Dang, has it been that long already? Only because I we my wife and I shamelessly went back and watched <laughs> the uh, the um, Laudna Death episode. Um, episode 34. But um, I was thinking maybe they've gotten strong enough to fight Adahan, but just like that dream sequence where Adahan was just like, you know, 35 points of damage and you're exhausted. Um, even still now, I'm like, 
maybe they're still like way too weak for Autohan. So I don't, I don't know what the level appropriate like meaningful stakes encounter is in the near future. <laughs> I feel like if they were full pa- full strength. And it was like just Autohan. Not to say that there couldn't be like some lackeys there, but like Ludness isn't there and you know there isn't some other major player. I think that they probably like that would be a good encounter for them. Like so I could I see think- if they could somehow <laughs> boil it down to like again, yeah. just Autohan's small circle, that might be like what they go tackle. I think whatever encounter they run into, if it is Autohan or whatever, I think there will be I think Matt will have another NPC there to help, and I think it might be Liliana. I could see that. Just to kind of like, you know, it's a nice, as a DM, it's kind of like a nice fail-safe. Not that you aren't comfortable with what happens, but like, I I think think every DM has like designed an encounter that you're like, this is going to be really tough. And then the party just like blows through it in like two rounds, and you're like, cool. And then, like, you make it really hard, and then suddenly the party's like, what the heck is this? <laughs> so, like, sometimes having that NPC there can kind of just, like, it's like it's a nice, like, difficulty slider, yeah. I feel like. So, Wait. No- notably, <laughs> I was just going to say, Dirge. like, Frank rides in on a dragon. <laughs> you guys are okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had Gurge for the fight with Ira, mm-hmm. um, which was probably... Um, uh the last like meaningful fight i can think of that was like um the party had a chance of actually like it, i don't say like equal power level but like like with Adahan, i think that was an unwinnable fight which i don't know if you feel the same way but maybe they if they hadn't spent like two rounds running away maybe they could have fought her yeah um i think given the circumstances it was unwinnable um but again maybe back then if they were full power and like we're going in to fight her, maybe. Yeah. But uh, the Ira fight, I think that one was unwinnable. And not just yeah. narr- not just like for narrative reasons, obviously, but like I think he's really powerful. And the the element there was the Callaway connection. Like that's the only reason they got which I know not not to dive into this because it's kind of irrelevant at this point, but I know a lot of people were like, Oh man, he just like Matt was just being really nice to them. Um it was obviously more than that. Like that was something that was a, this is a deep rooted part of her backstory. Um, right. But yeah, I see what you're saying. I could definitely see that element of maybe even like at the start of the fight, Liliana is against them, but there's like this moment where like she chooses her daughter over her, you know, yeah, her destiny or whatever you want to call it and helps them. But it's, but it's also been years of her on this journey. We don't know how long she's been with the, the Ruby Vanguard. Um, yeah. we, we know she, we know she's been gone for the entirety of Imogen's life. So, yeah. and Im- I mean, Imogen's twenties. Yeah. Some, yeah. 20 something. So it's probably been 15 to 20 years. Yeah. So, I mean, I would, ass- all, all I'm trying to say is I don't think she's going to like flip like that where Imogen's like, please right. mom don't. She's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think it would be like a, a high stakes moment where like the the turn happens. If so, and Liliana obviously is, we don't know her motivations, but is you know she's down, she's in a bad group, I guess, and she clearly has a reason to stay. So yeah, she's in deep too. Like Ludus right. made it seem like you know we owe a lot to your mother. Like your mother's the reason why we're pulling this off. He said something to that effect, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't so know. I wonder. I wonder what exactly her role in this is, because it seems beyond just an additional of the nameless Ruidus born that have, that have come here. Right. Also not. Okay. I don't want to get us too off track here, but I'm going to, I'm going to forget. Before you segue, before you segue, just hold that for a second. All I was saying, just because I say it every episode, it feels like to summarize, (laughs) it just feels like the bad guys are really bad. Yeah. (laughs) And the party is a little underpowered. For what seems to be the stakes they're coming up against. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seems that way. So it'll be interesting to see how Matt pulls all yeah. these these strings to make this, this solstice moment happen. I'm really interested to see how he does it. Because, I mean, the man is a one of the best in the world. So it'll be interesting to see how he kind of can set up these yeah. ultra high stakes while still, you know, being... Yeah. 
appropriate. Okay, what were you saying before I? Um, this is this kind on? of a this is kind of a shift, sort of, but it's just one thing I remembered when I was making my breakdowns for Vox Machina. Um, um, I'm trying to decide if any of this is spoilery. I don't think it really is, but in, dealing with the Raven Queen, um, or I was about to ask if you've seen the videos. We watched we watched the episodes together. I guess slight spoilers if you haven't finished Vox Machina yet. Um, but she's explaining to Vax when he like goes in that pool of blood and like kind of has that encounter with her. I was rewatching that moment from the original campaign and she's just kind of waxing poetic more on like life and death and like how she thinks undeath is an abomination. And like, that's why he needs to shepherd these souls, you know, like that's part of her purpose. And during that speech, one of the things she was talking about is like that immortal soul is so like precious and needs to be shepherd or whatever, but it's also like this ultra powerful, like source of power. Mm. And that's like one thing, like why it's so sought after, which is another part of her like purpose and guarding it. Um, And like people want to utilize that for, for foul purposes. I was wondering if like maybe what we talked about with all these Ruidus borns, like coming to this one spot, like what if, they are being sacrificed because like that, that energy from their soul is required to um, yeah. facilitate this. Now there's not much, like, much deeper than that. We basically already speculated on if they're being sacrificed or not, but just hearing the Raven queen talk about like the energy source of the immortal soul made me tap into that a bit more. Yeah. And it, it, I don't know the connection, but it does make me think of like the Lux and beacons. Like if, yeah. Uh, something inherently powerful about it if it can if it can sort of hold a soul um you know it's like uh the ghostbuster box but like <laughs> D D version i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's interesting and okay are we just broaching a new subject i kind of forgot where we were before i yeah we were just away. yeah okay. you were just yeah well while we're there then let's just keep talking about that excavation point in this malleus key and the Tishtan culture, which is where this is, which we've we briefly right. spoke about this somewhere in an earlier episode. I don't remember where. Um, but they, the Tishtan culture, for anybody that needs a refresher, we don't know that much about them. But they were just this like nomadic society that was obsessed with magic that like traveled around Exandria building like like rituals, like small little like shrines and stuff. And they just vanished one day. So I think what I speculated in a far earlier episode was that what if like that is the city on Ruidus? I don't know. I still don't know if like I if that if I'm really feeling that or not. But there's a culture that vanished and there's a city on Ruidus. Like maybe they're the same thing. Um, but this this shrine that they built is what they're using with this Malleus key, and we know that these people were this magic obsessed weird peoples like do you think they back in the day whenever that was were the first to kind of figure out what was going on with Ruidus and they were trying to do this very same thing and maybe the gods yeah. wiped them out and that's why they mysteriously disappeared they definitely there is like a, a tower of Babel vibe to it I feel yeah. like like exactly what you're saying like something something there that kind of gives a vibe of like the gods being like wait no not like that and just you know yeah. stomping them i will say it's i don't think they're related but i think it's interesting that this isn't the only group of people who mysteriously disappeared um presumably ashton's um uh what was the name of his um, again presumably um Hishari? Yeah, the Hishari group that also just disappeared one day. Well, did they disappear or did they just get dusted? Well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know. We just know that according to the museum that like something tragic happened and they are no more. Yeah. Um, all that to say there there seems to be a running theme of and this is I think this is just true in fantasy content in general, but dabbling in power beyond you your realization and then it you know um it's the old like i summon you jiraxis and then <laughs> you know squash <laughs> so yeah 
but yeah, I don't know. I think it's a great, obviously Matt knows, I mean, but it's, it is cool. Like these little tiny breadcrumbs he gives of like lore details that he's built out. Um, and I think presumably we would get more information about them at some point. Yeah. I mean, I hope so, at least, because it's interesting. So you're saying the Spire is like a relic of the Tishtan group? Yeah, like they built that. Okay. Maybe, I'm not saying they had the exact same goals as whatever Ludinus, Autahan, and the Ancelia are doing, but maybe it was like a similar thing. They were trying to utilize yeah. the Apogee Solstice to potentially free Pradothos. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a, an excavation site. So, I mean, they could have, you know, dug down into this crater and dug it up. Um, when, I, when I was watching, I thought it was because of the uh, pre-Calamity Golems, which the party theorized could be, some of them could be Hobmodads. Um, I thought maybe the fact that they have these, they clearly have access to pre-Calamity technology, um, which would make sense if Ludinus is from pre calamity. Mm -hmm. Um, but also I thought maybe they built the spire in addition to the Malleus key, mm. like utilizing the power of like this relic site. But I think I like your Tishtan theory more. I think that makes a little bit more sense. Well, yeah, now I can't remember the exact way Matt described it. Cause I, I think you just said there was a spire that the Malleus key was like kind of built up against. Okay. And also we didn't mention this in the recap, but notably this is the sort of main Malleus key. And we talked about this by the way, of like what happens now that the Malleus key and the Feywild is destroyed. Like obviously mm -hmm. it's not just going to stop the Apogee solstice, but Matt mentioned like this, this one seems to be like the main one, like the big one. Um, so I think we will get like levels of impact, like, this is going to happen, but it's not quite as bad as what would have happened if you hadn't been successful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. He mentioned something about like the one in the shadow fell in the Feywild, like their entire purpose was just to like siphon more energy to this one. So like it all right. centers around this one. And um, he maybe you mentioned in the recap, the like extra arcane power sources and stuff they were like implementing and like digging deep into the earth to protect. So I kind of also took that as like, we're doing this to make up for that one being destroyed too. So they might not even, even though they went and destroyed that, like it might not even make any difference ultimately if they're able to but just, it, but it's also a little silly though too. Cause it's like, Oh, if they can just put these control rods, why even go through the trouble of the Fey wild and the shadow fell? Yeah. I don't know. You know? Like, and, and all obviously like there's a tense relationship with the unseelie court. Like why even, why even navigate the politics of that, you know, which I, I think there will be a more robust answer to that, but that was my immediate gut gut for me. For me, the control rods was less. Now we don't have the Feywild. wild. Let's make up for it. And more, because I think Travis called him even a fail safe more. Let's build these things for this one. So that if someone comes along and tries to blow up like the power cores on it, yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, so no, still, yeah. still hurt by not having the Feywild one, but putting in th ways to protect this one. Yeah. I, I think you're just to be clear, a hundred percent right on that. Like that is absolutely what they're doing, but I didn't know if it was maybe also a little column a, maybe not though. Um, but yeah, the, you bring up a good point of, you know, if that, if they were doing that, why even bother with the other realms? Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I'm just rambling now, but I am so curious to see. Maybe we don't even get this answer, but like what each party wants out of this, because it's something we talked about in our last episode about if if the Unseelie and Ludinus and Autohan are potentially these like three different distinct entities as far as this is going. Like, what does each one of them want or do they really do all want the same thing? But I think at the very least, the Unseelie has their own motives and then that does not even to mention the shadow fell we don't even know like what what party is behind that one right maybe it's maybe it's still just them but i don't know there could be a whole other group that's involved here yeah and i i don't at this point i don't see bell's hells going to the shadow fell with 
11 yeah. days left. I think they're very much feeling the timetable. But then the question also becomes, like, I think Matt's going to give them some direction this next episode because it's like, what, what do we do now at this point? Yeah. Um, I'd, I honestly would agree with you unless they think that after what they just saw that they can't handle that one. And maybe yeah. they're like the shot, but then again, the shadow fell is an unknown. Well, actually they did get that information from Rin that another group was in the shadow fell already. So maybe to them right. that would be like, okay, that one is out of our hands. Right. And, you know, not even to mention the fact that they don't even have a way to get there. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Ren. Mm-hmm. So petrified, maybe by a, some sort of creature, maybe by lewdness. Um, this yeah. has been, has this been their most powerful NPC ally up to this point? Like ever across all campaigns well, or just this campaign? No, no, this campaign. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Do you think more powerful than Keyleth? Oh. Probably not. Okay. Because we know Keyleth is, they're dealing with something too. Because I'm just thinking about who are their allies right now who can help. Yeah. I want to talk um, about that too, though. So okay. Don't forget. Okay, so um, we'll table that for a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got super nervous for the group as soon as Planes Rider Ren was found out to be petrified. I mean, it's just, I guess yeah. I don't really want to get too much into this because we're just retreading the same ground like, oh, it's so powerful, but. Um, <laughs> but no, that's a great, yeah. that's a great point that we didn't really bring up during that conversation is, or maybe we kind of did, but yeah, if she just got taken off the board like that, like what chance do they have? Um, which well, it's all- like, and that's why I'm like, where do they go at this point? Cause they, like, like you said, they can't just go to the excavation site now. Right. I mean, like, wouldn't that be suicide? Maybe the, the real weird thing is that Odahan can sim- seemingly can simply spy on them. Just like, Imogen has the ability to right because I would say like what if they went on like a covert mission you know like disguise themselves as Rudus borns that were like flocking to this area but that won't work right because Odahan can just like dreamscape them and be like I see you yeah Odahan is like Sauron the all-seeing eye like I, <laughs> I just I just have a hard time envisioning them like sneaking in but um, maybe they get some sort of magical item or something that can like like not not that what yeah not that what Odahan is doing is scrying, but there are items that like prevent you being scried on. So like maybe there's yeah. like some sort of item they could yeah. get that would cloak them in that way, and then maybe they could go for like a covert op or something. There was the uh, in in calamity. There was the ring, uh, mm-hmm. ring of something. Yeah, I don't that, know what it was. Uh, Pacia had or like yeah. all, like well, all of those people had yeah. basically. Yeah. Right. Um, so, which. One thing I wanted to mention on you, you mentioned the Hadmadads, uh, which I was thinking my, f- not that that that's a perfectly fine line to draw, but the first thing I thought of were the tax men from, uh, Oh my gosh. From yeah. The, these uh, seemed way more nefarious and just crazy compared to the Hadmadads for sure. But I, and I think maybe the Hadmadad comment was like, maybe like towards like some of the other golems or mm. whatever. Yeah, I love that theory, by the way. I don't know if there were enough back then True for them, unless they like, you know, got the blueprints, but that'd be crazy if it was the tax men. <laughs> Which we know that one, I mean, there's the potential that lewdness was just around back then, but even if he wasn't, we know like from campaign two that he was like obsessed with the, with the, the, the ruined sites of these cities. So like he was exploring them excavating them so he could have garnered the technology that way even if he wasn't there but i think that's definitely the implication right is that these these are aormatons essentially this is just like fcg um so yeah they them alone would be like above their power level yeah i mean i maybe just one would be okay but That'd be crazy though. It was the tax man. I would love, I'm like, yes, feed me all these calamity callbacks, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. I like that. And then one thing I wanted to just mention really quick on plane rider Ren, which I don't let me give my classic disclaimer here. I don't even think this is like a, fa- a parallel to be drawn, but I'm going to draw it anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for my people that saw campaign two, and this isn't really spoilery cause I'm just going to, 
we're already in in the muck of it for what it would relate to. Um, but in campaign two, when they were kind of looking through one of the ruins of uh, Aeor, um, they come across this like part of the city, if you will, that was like frozen in time. And it was kind of like a, again, without getting in the weeds of it, like almost like a fail safe type of thing. Like when the, everything was going to, to hell, like there was like this room that was like, people were still like, you know, like frozen where they were. And that reminded me of what Rin is, but I, I cause in that case though, they oh. weren't, they weren't stone. And I think the implication here is that Rin is like stone. Right? Yeah, I think it was almost explicitly said she okay. was petrified. So yeah, with that being the case, then I definitely don't think they're similar, but it made me think of that moment, especially with these Aormatons being present and stuff. So I don't think you that's need why a, I like the point there. Don't you need a greater restoration to break out a petrification? Or is yeah. there other other ways? Because that I think, Yeah, I think there are other ways. Like there's some like okay. potions you can get, but you basically okay. need some some big magic like that. Well, because that's the other thing. There's now this rescue side of, you know, it's like, okay, no, none of them have greater restoration. So, oh, yeah, like, do they not? What? Does, I guess FCG would be the only one that could maybe have it. I don't think he has it. I don't even know what level you get it, honestly. Um, but yeah, I wonder, like, do they have a basilisk or are, is, I did wonder is that, yeah. just capable of this? Is one of those Aormatons well, capable uh, of this? There's flesh to stone, which is a six level spell. Mm. Um, so could have done that, but uh, let's see. Greater restoration is a fifth level spell. Um, they're level eight. I think so. I think so. Right. Okay. So they don't have fifth level spells, right? You know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Well, while, while I'm looking this up real quick. Um, okay. Here we go. Oh, they do have. No, they don't. It's level nine is when they get their first fifth level spell. Okay, but they're level eight, so they're probably, they're not they're not far they're not far away. That's true. Um, so. so they might have it by the time they would get to her, potentially. Right. Right. Um, okay. Um, but I'm yeah, bring up Lilith. yeah. I, one last piece on the. The thing is that I'm very, very curious to see what's going on with this structure, um, the potential Tishtan one, I mean, if that is what it is. And we know this is the same exact place that the Apogee Solstice was however many years ago. Um, so it's interesting that, I don't know, there just feels like, we know that Plain Rider Rins, you know, theorized that the, the ley line shifting was like a cycle and it would eventually land in the same space. Um, the fact that it is the exact same spot leads me to, again, believe that maybe it's because if, again, if it was the Tishtans that they were trying to do this very same thing for maybe yeah. different reasons. Um, yeah. History but, repeats itself. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just excited to see. Yeah. Going back to leveling, by the way, I was just looking at cleric at level 10, they get divine intervention when a cleric can call for assistance Ooh, on behalf of their deity. That'll be fun. And I think, I think there could be some really cool, um, developments with the chain, change bringer. It kind of feels like that's what he's latching onto. Yeah. And, um, I've loved like the memory around the coin flip. And so it'd be cool if that kind of develops into something a little bit more substantial, I guess. So. Yeah. That's a good call. I think you're right. Cause that, I mean, it's way worse than a coin flip, right? Because for divine intervention, you have to like roll less than your level or something. I think. So it's, it's a like, uh, percentile dice. Um, you roll a number equal to or lower than your cleric level, and your deity yeah. intervenes. So yeah, so it's like a massive coin flip. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that'll that'll definitely be fun. Um. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Keyleth because we're coming towards the end of our episode. Let's talk about Keyleth. Um, yeah. There were there were some details there that was like over my head, and Matt fortunately like jumped in and kind of like gave a little bit of clarity. But I was still I was having trouble like kind of placing like where she was, what she was referencing. So, um, sorry, help me help walk me through mm -hmm. kind of what her message was. All right, so she she clearly you know like we found out in an earlier episode, she has like fifty fires she's trying to put out on regarding the solstice you know aside from anything bells hells is telling her so she's telling them that currently she's beneath terra which isn't just 
a name for Earth, even though it is, uh, but she didn't mean it that way. Terra is literally the name of the city that the Earth Ashari live in. So it's like similar to Zephra, which is where, you know, Orem is from, or Pyra, which we saw in the Legend of Vox Mach. And is it like a floating city or is she underground? I think she's underground, but, but not like, I don't know that the entire city itself is necessarily underground, but she said something is rooted beneath. So that made me think that like, She's beneath Terra, um, and the rift is in danger. So the rift meaning to the earth elemental plane, just like, you know, the fire elemental plane is like, that's what all the Ashari people are there for. They're all guarding those rifts to the perspective planes. Um, so why do they need to be guarded? Just cause, um, <clears throat> you know, back in the, in the er, in the early histories with the calamity and the schism and you know the divergence and all these things like elementals started like pouring out into the world and they kind of got it reigned under control and the, that's when the ashari people were like all right we're splitting into four tribes each one of us is going to like maintain this balance between okay, exandria so not, and fire exandria and water you know yeah so they're not like pr- protecting from like people going in they're like trying to make sure like elementals aren't like pouring out yeah they, you know they're just druids that are tending to the the planet and each one has their specific focus okay um but so terra is the earth one and here's where i can't i'm not entirely sure what exactly is being said because she says something is rooted beneath and the rift is in danger so i don't think something i don't think the something that's rooted beneath is in reference to the rift itself right like I feel like she's talking about two things there, but I guess it's at least possible that she means the rift itself. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But I'm assuming it means two things, but what do you think? Well, I'm just reading this, uh, critical role fandom page. Um, it's in the center of the cliff keep mountains, North of Craghammer. Craghammer They went to in campaign one, right? Or mm-hmm. that's where campaign one started. Pre- okay. Yeah. Cause They're, I do remember the Twitch that. stream at least. Okay. So this is in Taldore then. Yeah, I think so. So right. because of that, like we never saw it in the original campaign because Keyleth had already like been there before they started streaming. Okay. So what do you think is going on there? She says they may be, this may be related, which I think was interesting. Yeah. So to me, I feel like someone is, again, planning on using this solstice. The planes overlap. We know that. So clearly the Earth elemental plane just like all the other ones is like overlapping with exandria and there's like i guess potential there which made me think of the the ono plateau from exu um with all that like fire and just power or potential whatever abria called it that's what my mind went to and that's what i'm thinking here too is like somebody is trying to utilize this overlapping of these planes to do something um i don't know are they trying to release earth elementals are they trying to just utilize pure power for another purpose i love that callback yeah because the ono plateau basically though though unrelated to like the ultimate story of season one of exu was part of like this theme of and use sort of like close to the exact phrasing because i can't remember it exactly but like even that something was trying to come through, but mm-hmm. that in general, something was coming, something was happening, um, which I don't know if it's related to this plan with Pradathos, but definitely seems like either it's related or it's part of this storyline of the Apogee Solstice, like all these other yeah, someone else might, Yeah, some other party might be utilizing yeah. it for something else, which the Ono Plateau was basically in Pyra, which right. is the fire Ashari place. So like, I think that is like a direct correlation. Like maybe the same group is trying to utilize these elemental planes for something, probably not anything good. Um, right. Because yeah, there was like a fire elemental that they had to fight at the top of the, the Ono plateau or whatever. Well, no, it was Mr. Stepped on the That's sigil. Right. That's right. And turned him into um, a fire elemental. That's right. So, so yeah. yeah, something happening with the elemental plane sort of infringing on Exandria in some way. Which the other 
The only other potential line I'm drawing here is the fact that Keyleth got attacked by those gray assassins where Orem's husband and father-in-law died. May and we didn't we didn't really know what was the point of that attack. Um maybe it was testing the waters of like if we're gonna strike on all these Ashari's people, like we need to know what we're dealing with. So like is maybe Odahan behind this? Um like maybe it is related to Pradathos, or maybe it's not, and it's just re like related to whatever Odahan ultimately wants. Yeah, the attack on Zephyr still feels flimsy to me. Um so I'm I'm definitely not sure what what was involved there. I think either they said this or someone said it on Reddit, but possibly I don't know if you can hear this baby crying in the background, but <laughs> <laughs> um, something. yeah, possibly a distraction, like a diversion. Um is it true that Zephra like is responsible for Broomstone or Broomstone in some way? Uh I don't think so. Oh, there's okay. a, I think there's another I can't remember the name of it, but like there was another company that's like always oh, okay. done the brimstone. Oh, right, that's right. Um, or maybe I'm thinking of um, not unobtainium. <laughs> What's like the really powerful? Um, uh, oh, residuum. That's white stone. Oh, okay. Well then, but still, maybe a distraction of some kind. Who knows? But for what? Um, <laughs> that whole thing still feels really flimsy, though. Um, like even just gate. I know Orem said it feels like they were like testing defenses, but. You know, Adahan, I feel like Adahan has way more bigger interests than this, like, fake attack on Zephra. But maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll find out. But, I mean, if it was related to whatever's going on with all these elemental planes, then, I mean, presumably the elemental plane to air is in Zephra. So maybe they were just, I mean, maybe it wasn't even an attack. Maybe they were just infiltrating and they did something and they don't even know what they did because they just were focused on the attack. You know, maybe, I, maybe while that attack was happening, yeah. somebody else was like at the elemental rift or something and did something. All right. If you want to hear like an ultimate reach, like a <laughs> definitely not, but maybe um, going with the theme of pre calamity, trying to free Pradathos, like these callbacks to calamity and like, you mm -hmm. know, all that kind of stuff. Rashan and Kamort were the elemental lords of fire and earth. And yeah. these are the two planes that we're seeing somehow True. impressing or um, not invading, but just like something happening with these two planes. Now we know as Brennan described it, they were, you know, pew, sent off and destroyed. But I just wonder if there's going to be some callback to them hmm. either. So Again, that's like my 99%, just like never, not at all, but like, but maybe something. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, I can. I just Mephisto a little bit. Yeah, I can remember. Did he describe them getting like obliterated or was it just like. He says. Sent away. I can't remember. Only because I've shamelessly watched this, like these final minutes, like so many times. He says something along the lines of they are um, sent off. Um, like disassembled and destroyed, basically. Okay. So al almost like bifrosted through like so many different like dimensions that they, you know, yeah, are destroyed. So interesting. Well, I mean, who knows how the 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 nuts and bolts of this work? But like, I wonder if another primordial eventually rises to take over that space in a way or something. You know, like even if they yeah. are gone, maybe there still are these like primordial titans that could be released and did like i know this is like a spoiler territory but like did thordak when he was in the when he was in fire did he report to anyone or no <laughs> like he, oh, he okay. didn't no he was just uh you know a, gi a giant douche <laughs> yeah trapped there <laughs> yeah, okay i don't know if it'd be like it's his boss who's coming through <laughs> <laughs> karen <laughs> oh no the true bbeg yeah Okay. Well, um, yeah, lots, lots to think about and it could be a pretty awesome episode tonight. Um, yeah. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. One thing I want to ask you is, do you think Morgan is going to be okay? Like, do you, I know clearly they messaged her and, and she was fine from that battle, but you know, she mentioned like, we'll see if they come like 
talk to me about this. And she made it like implied that like, if they did, they're screwed, but I don't know. Like she, and I don't know. She may, seemingly could have made like a very powerful enemy in that moment. So I'm just the back of my mind. I'm kind of worried that like, is she going to be all right? I'd be really sad if they like went to visit her and like, she's dead and like everything's destroyed. Um, presumably the Unseelie court, I mean, she's pissing off an archfey and you know, that yeah. whole group. So well, I don't know. His, it's like, his name's not Saruman, but it starts with an no, S. I yeah. Think. Um, it's not important. I guess. Samsonite. <laughs> um, Sar- Saramar? Saramar? Seminar. 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 Yeah. I could see like, he, I'm, he certainly is not going to be happy with this. I don't know about right. the, the, in, the political interrelations of the Archfey, but I, I yeah. kind of imagine that they must have like, not, they must not all be best friends. I bet they're almost kind of right. like jealous, like, like warring kingdoms in a way. So I could see right. that being like a big deal that she stepped yeah. on his territory. And he's seemingly highly invested in this plan also. So yeah. Yeah, so, that's a I mean, point. I don't want anything to happen to her, but I wouldn't. I feel like this moment will not go without some sort of consequence. Right. Right. So, uh, one other detail I was going to add too was I liked the connection between um, Imogen's like psychic elemental and it being a Relora. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that as well? Yeah, yeah. Which that's I hadn't. Put, maybe that was obvious to everyone previously, but for me, it was putting two and two together. Like she's literally like summoning. <laughs> Didn't we talk Aurora. about this? Did we? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe we did. I don't maybe know. Maybe not. But yeah, I, I, I was hoping, and maybe they still will. But try what the party was suggesting. Like, hey, summon it, and let's like, yeah, see if we can make anything happen here. So, yeah. and it okay. would be cool if, and I know we got to go, so I'll say this real quick. But it would be cool if similar to how they described like the Relora were different, like some were aggressive somewhere or whatever. Like if each time she summoned one, it was different, like uh, not yeah. the same entity. That'd be kind Some of were cool. just built different. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let us know what you think about this episode, guys. It's kind of your thoughts and theories. And um, we'll be catching out a new episode tonight. Um, and thanks for watching our discussion. We're going to try to get these back to getting out a little bit earlier in the week. Yeah. Um, yeah, now that box mocking is over, especially yeah. we can hopefully yeah. get on a, a little bit better schedule. Uh, what for the thumbnail? Thumbnail. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't. I keep. I just keep thinking about the gloam gut, but I don't know how that really translates to a thumbnail. Yeah, we could do like. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like they were doing like the predator vibes of like soaking in the mud or just like kind of hiding, I guess. Okay. While the blood blood was like, you know. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) I like that. Which which one are you? Um, I'll hide. Okay. Okay. Schnoish. Wait, do we get it? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Nice. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching. We'll catch you later. Bye, y'all. See ya.